Hello, my name is Duncan Will. I'm an accounting and auditing loss prevention specialist with Cameco Mutual Insurance. I'm here to talk, about, talk to you about documentation. I'll tell you, it's like the best risk management advice you can follow is clearly document what you've done. It's your get out of jail free card. Um, basically, your problem is that the public out there, the people that are going to be sitting in a jury box, um, believe that CPAs are scribes and that we write everything down. So if there is a disagreement as to uh, what was done, said, what was the agreed upon, ding, 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 there's the problem for you as the CPA. If you haven't memorialized it, the benefit of the doubt will go to the party that is alleging that you didn't do the right thing or you didn't do what you said you were going to be doing. So yeah, this is the power of documentation. First off, Sally. I came into public accounting in 1979 and Sally, I think, was born in 1979. Well, Sally passed away during COVID. Do not use Sally as part of your documentation regimen because what is the same as last year doesn't give you the comfort it might well have in the past. So please take this out of your acronyms that you use in memorializing things. Also, and I have borrowed this from the AICPA's Auditing Standards Board and or just AICPA period, but this sort of timeline here was developed by the AICPA, I think in particular the Auditing Standards Board in coming up with the implementation of um, the new quality management standards. And I say new because they're newly issued and not even newly issued. They're over a year old. It was May of 2022 that these came out. But we're supposed to be applying these things by December 2025 and assessing these things uh, during 2026. So let's get to it. Right now, you're operating under the quality control standards. That's under Statement of Quality Control Standards number eight which supersedes one through seven. So squash eight is what you're following now. And that is going to sunset in December of 2025. And between now and then, uh, the AICPA wishes for us to adopt, implement, come up with a plan to address these uh, seven QM components, quality management components. And I'm showing you there sort of timelines and green and red and blue uh, that basically says, hmm, uh, when are you supposed to be performing each of these functions? Uh, the idea here is you're supposed to be going back and saying, hey, uh, what is it we're doing? What is it we have to change to do? And have we appropriately addressed those changes? And what is really predicate for this is that, yeah, we're supposed to be doing this like we do on our auditing standards on a risk assessment basis. So what is the risk that you are not going to be putting out something that complies with the standards? Mm -hmm. assess those risks, see what you've been doing up until now, do those adequately address it, brainstorm with everybody. I'm going to encourage you to come up with a quality management czar within your firm to be the one that runs point on all this. But please notice as is in that stop sign there, you cannot say, hey, I'm going to adopt this for this particular standard or this particular service and slowly but surely piecemeal adopt this. No, when you adopt, you're going to be adopting it globally within your firm. Um, good news. The AICPA did, as they did with the quality control standards, come up with some practice aids. And we've got one here that is appropriate for sole practitioners and another one that's for small practitioners. But these aren't off the shelf, go with these so that we don't have to do anything. Rather, they are to help you walk through coming up with how you should be developing your own. Some of you might be thinking, hey, you know what? There's a guy across the street from me that is a lot like my firm, uh, they uh, are probably gonna adopt this and I'll just shoot, borrow theirs. No, you've gotta come up with what works best for your firm and have it be very nuanced to be appropriate for the, your firm. So one size fits all doesn't end up working. To the extent that you wish to have access to these things, here's a link that you can access these practice aids and quite frankly, I would encourage you to be looking in the Journal of Accountancy uh, for frequent updates, look for content that's being provided online by your state society, by the AICPA, and whatever resource you can find on how to most effectively and efficiently comply with these standards and implement them. Okay, here's an example of why documentation is so important. Admittedly, this predated uh, most recent guidance out there 
but it was something that was from the Cameco's claims history out here. A CPA compiled financial statements for a client for 10 years. Well, you have to have an engagement letter when you're doing a compilation. This guy didn't have it. Basically, there was a theft. The party that uh, got the client that got impacted turned around and said, whoa, 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 CPA, you're the one that's responsible for this. I thought that you should be addressing this. The CPA was trying to defend themselves by saying, no, 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 no. On a compilation, we provide nothing in the way of assurance. What evidence do you have that that's really what you were doing and they understood the, the service? Unless you have an engagement letter that clearly articulates your responsibilities and their responsibilities, and those responsibilities mirror those required by professional standards. In this case, the statement on standards for accounting and review services. Yeah, you've got a problem. So have an engagement letter and clearly articulate what you need to be doing. Okay. When documenting, also understand that whatever it is you've documented may very well be what is being used as exhibit A, B, or C um, by the prosecution in coming up uh, with charges against you. So please, when you're initialing and dating that work paper that you're signing off on, reflect on whether it or not it adequately addresses what it was that you did. The less is more documentation policy no, that's a fallacy. You're putting yourself at risk. Okay, why and when to defensively document? Now, this defensive documentation isn't the term of art you will have heard in the professional literature. It's something the Cameco coined um, many years ago. And what we're getting at here is you want to document in such a way that it, it, it buttresses you against allegations that you did not satisfy, meet the standard of care. So if somebody comes back later and says, no, 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 you didn't do that. Yeah, your documentation is your get out of jail free card. Yeah, jurors, not CPAs, are gonna be the ones sitting on your jury. You may very well have served on a jury before, but I guarantee you, you have never sat on an accountant's malpractice jury. While the defense would love to have you sitting in there, prosecution is gonna make sure you don't. So. Mm -mm. If you have any doubt that what you're doing is something that should be documented or that you would be better off coming up with greater documentation, um, please satisfy that. Please know that unlike peer reviewers that would say, no, 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 um, lack of documentation doesn't mean you didn't comply with the standards. It just means that um, you have poor documentation, ding, ding, ding. You really haven't complied with the jury standards if you have poor or no documentation. Basically, any advice that you gave, anything that you had to clarify what it was that you did, if you didn't do it, could very well come back to haunt you. Okay, so far I've been really talking about your engagement letter. I've also been talking about work papers. Well, please know that the things that you do internally can end up coming back to haunt you. Where you're doing an MS Teams chat with somebody, you're texting to somebody, um, emails to clients or internally within the office. Yeah, all of those are discoverable. So treat them as if they would be something that would be presented at trial against you. To the extent that you're going to be able to provide it as a defense, God bless, you did the right thing. But to the extent that it is incriminating, you really got to be careful about that. Okay, levels of documentation. Yeah, internal documentation. These are your work papers. Um, these are the checklists that you had for doing all this work. The correspondence that you had with a client. That's wonderful to have. Your emails with them. A confirming letter. What am I talking about here? This is when you communicate with them and get them to write a communication back to you confirming something or vice versa. Merely stating it to them isn't sufficient if they can later allege that they misunderstood what you meant. No, get something back in writing from them. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about is the confirming letter, okay? Okay, so when is this documentation vital? Sadly, you're not gonna know until seven months after the fact what ended up being vital to you. So whatever, whenever you're coming up with the scope of the engagement, articulate it, put it in writing to the extent that it's gonna be modified. So the client comes to you and asks you to do something over and above what you agreed to in your engagement letter, spell that out. Do you have to have a new engagement letter? No, not necessarily, uh, but I'd have something in an email to them clearly articulating that hey, you have asked us to do X, Y, and Z in addition to the engagement Z, X, which we were going to be doing. 
and you, and we have agreed to do that. Uh, what we will require from you is A, B, and C before we do that. And assuming you get us A, B, and C will be done by whatever date. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So they can't come back later and allege, well, you promised you'd have it all done by January 13th. Huh? I never wrote that down. Well, that's what you told me. Yeah, this is where you get in trouble. The he said, she said moment uh, doesn't work to your favor. So to the extent that you've got bad um, facts on a, a tax situation, yeah, to the extent that you're giving advice to them on how to address these things, recognize that they will often hear what they wish to hear. So you've got to clearly articulate the bad news and or the limited scope of the advice that you're giving to them. Another one is when disengaging. Now, some of you are going to say, hey, wait, wait, uh, I rarely disengage from my clients, but occasionally my clients disengage me. I want you to document the disengagement when your clients disengage you. Whenever this relationship concludes, you want to have evidence in your work records that you have communicated to them, spelling out that you are aware that you've stopped work as of a particular date and what actions they need to be taking on what was left open. More on that later. Um, a, a client has an elevated malpractice risk, ding, ding, ding. When they do, wait a minute, do I really want to be doing this? Document what those risks are, how you've addressed those risks, and what steps you've ended up taking, whether to expand the scope of your services or decline or limit the scope of your services. And the last one is, yeah, document when you decide that this thing is getting a little bit too risky and you're thinking of getting out of Dodge. Now, I put in here, wait a minute, this is a whole bunch riskier, get paid for it. That isn't my preference. My preference is, gosh, it's gotten a heck of a lot riskier. Make it so it's not risky either by disengaging or limiting your scope. Getting paid more for the risk you're accepting is not a panacea. Okay, so what is good documentation? There are five essential components here to it. Engagement letters, ding, ding, ding. Have something that clearly articulates the services that you're going to be perform performing and what their responsibilities and your responsibilities are. Document what you've done throughout the engagement. Document whenever this relationship ends, um, the terms of doing so, and as of the date it's going to be. Non-engagement letters. Some of you have never heard of that. Um, but the, the essence here is, is when somebody comes to you, maybe it's a referral from your next door neighbor or one of your best clients, and they say, hey, you really want to do Chris Jones' work. You meet with Chris Jones. You talk with them. He brings in, he or she brings all in all their information. And you sit back after they've left and go, this isn't a good fit. You look through the materials and last year's tax prepare got it done for considerably less than you would. And there's a whole bunch more issues in there that um, weren't clearly articulated to you. So you're going to want to non-engage. That's where you send them a communication saying, Sorry, it was good meeting with you. We never did engage to do this work. Please understand that you'll need to secure the services of another qualified professional to do this and come by anytime you want to pick up the things that you left behind. By the way, the advice I gave you is not something that you can be relying upon because, yeah, we never formally uh, completed um, our services related to that. Also, this last one, interactions. To the extent that you have telephone conversations, meetings with clients, I want you to memorialize your understanding of what happened. Who was there? What was discussed? What action items came out of it? And yeah, who was responsible for each of those action items? Okay, so how to begin. Ad adopt a documentation policy within your firm, which emphasizes defensive documentation, not merely what happened, but what would be buttress you if six to seven months from now, somebody came back and alleged that what you've just documented wasn't the facts. Yeah, clearly articulate that. So yeah, develop engagement letters. This time of year, Cameco is crafting engagement letters for a variety of services, whether it's us, whether it's a PPC, whether it's something with affiliates that you have, come up with that and make sure that they meet these professional standards out there that need to be done for whatever type of service you're doing. So prepare them annually and go off with one-offs on these things as you need to. Um, Cameco crafts sample engagement letters for audits, but yeah, you're gonna have some that aren't GAAP. You're gonna have different financial reporting frameworks. You're gonna have some when tax returns are being done as well. And to the extent that you're doing any of these things and there's gonna be a change, yeah, modify those changes. So here, 
is a list of items that you're gonna to wanna to consider having as clauses within your engagement letters. I'm gonna tell you that anytime we come up with a engage, new engagement letter, we're gonna have pushback from some clients and they go on both ends of the spectrum. Um, you, you ignored this clause and this clause and this clause. Um, I, do I really need to have those? And the others are saying, I don't want this to be more than three pages. Why is it so long? So you can't satisfy everybody. In certain types of services, Cameco puts out sort of a basic and a, an expanded version of these things. But that being said, what we have here are some things you really need to be spelling out in your engagement letters. So here we go. What's the objective of what you're doing? You'll find that uh, the AICPA developed this as a um, protocol on all of their engagements. Describe your objectives. Uh, specifically, what are you going to do? And to the extent that you're not going to be doing something that your client might be expecting you to do, scope that out. I'll spell out what not just what your responsibilities are, but what your client's responsibilities are. Especially in those instances where the client has said, gosh, this is really getting expensive. Is there anything we can do to make it less expensive? And they are agreeing to do A, B, and C. Well, memorialize that they have agreed to do A, B, and C, and that the fee arrangement is predicated on them doing that and timely doing that. Come up with dates certain in which they are supposed to be doing that. So what are the fee collection terms on this? When are you gonna get paid? Um, if they don't pay you timely, you should have a stop work clause on anything that's a progress bill engagement. So the idea is if it's not a one and done, but rather we're gonna get this done over time and that client is not paying you timely, you can't allow them to leverage you like that or leave you in that cash flow concern where you are being able to meet cash flow needs and or be left with a huge bill at the end that they have yet to pay. So add a stop work clause indicating that, hmm, if you don't meet the terms of our arrangement, then we have the right to stop work. And to the extent that you are harmed by us stopping work, nope, you acknowledge and agree that um, we are immunized uh, from that. There is no liability to your firm for having done so. Always request the client to sign your engagement letter. Now, some of you are gonna go, no, 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 that's kind of problematic. Um, what we'd rather have is a unilateral engagement letter that says, hey, to the extent that you give us the information to prepare the, your tax return, uh, that's sufficient uh, to, to understand that you have accepted the terms of this agreement. Can you do that? Yes. Is that as good as having the client sign that engagement letter? No. And to the extent that even if you do have that clause in there, I would still strongly encourage you to request that they sign that engagement letter and leave that not as the default, but as a back door if they don't end up doing it. Um, yeah, always make sure that the requirements of professional standards are met. So I have sort of a checklist of this clause, this clause, this clause is there, et cetera. Where on financial statement engagements, there can be problems is when it comes to supplemental information, what the responsibility is for the statement of cash flows, what's the responsibility, are there gonna be disclosures as client elected to omit substantially all disclosures. Okay, and then down here at the bottom, we're talking about disputes. To the extent that there's a dispute, whether it be fee or otherwise, you should address how that's gonna be handled. Some practitioners leave that blank as to what mediation company they're gonna be using. I think that's a mistake. You should be specifying which mediation company you're gonna be using, uh, mediator, and you should have a different arrangement for fee disputes than other disputes. The idea here is to the extent that CPAs might um, not be paid and to the extent that there is a fee dispute, you don't want to be in a position where you would wish to sue to collect those outstanding fees. Why? Because if you do, it can trigger a countersuit. Cameco has found that these countersuits often cost the CPA much more than the fees that they're owed. So come up with an arrangement so you don't have to uh, sue so that you know, avoid the possibility of a countersuit by going with a binding arbitration clause for fee disputes. More on that later. So what to avoid in engagement letters? Yeah, don't put marketing information in there. Don't be trying to suggest that you are uh, the, the best CPA in whatever community you're in, that uh, you we're sure that we will meet or exceed your needs. Um, that is not for a part of the engagement letter, which is a contract. Anything that's all encompassing language should be left out of it. So absolutes, anything exhaustive, every, things like that, get them out of your engagement letter. Um, unsigned unilateral letters, 
I don't like them. Uh, you can do them, uh, but I would strongly discourage you from doing so. And use of terms that could be misinterpreted. So don't use the word examine unless it's on a test engagement. Use review if indeed it is a review engagement under the SARS or for that matter under the uh, attestation standards. And evergreen letters. What's an evergreen letter? An evergreen letter is one that says, we're going to continue doing these services for you until either you disengage us or we disengage you. Why is this problematic? Well, it turns out that it's best to end up having a refresher on what the scope and limits are of your duties, what their responsibilities are, et cetera. And more importantly, the statute of limitations doesn't begin to run until your services are concluded. So if you've got an evergreen letter, you could have been doing this work for them for four years and the statute of limitations hasn't begun because your deliverable hasn't been finished. So yeah, Cameco strongly discourages people from using evergreen letters unless they're gonna go ahead and add some language in there that says every deliverable um, is once we have sent it to you, um, that's when the deliverable begins. Okay, step two, document wisely. And some of you are looking at this person and saying, why has Duncan got that person pointing a finger there? Uh, well, it dates me, but before I came into public accounting, there was a television show called Welcome Back, Cotter. And the guy you're looking at here is the actor, John Travolta. Uh, he played a guy named Vinny Barbarino, which was a high school student that uh, he kept uh, defending himself, trying not to be pinned in a corner and saying, what, who, what do you, uh? and sort of claiming ignorance. You got to answer all those questions that then he would have been posing out there. The who, what, where, when, why, how. That's the kind of stuff that you want to end up being documented. So come up with standardized forms to do so. Um, some of you still like paper. Some of you are embracing the electronic age and going paperless. I'm going to tell you, you can have both within your environment. And to the extent that you have completable PDFs, do so. But the idea is have a format, have a structure that your firm is supposed to follow for the regimented things that you're going to be doing, the protocols that need to be followed. Make sure that those are accessible. So you don't want to go, oh, darn it, I just finished a telephone call with somebody. What's the format I'm supposed to be doing? Where would I find that? You're having to go to the file room. No, you should have something accessible if it's paperless uh, up on your network to the extent that it's a a uh, document, a pad of paper would be used, and I would encourage you to have that a different color than other paper so that you can really find that. And make it so that it's second nature to do these. I'm going to tell you that when I am speaking to policyholders, as I will be this afternoon, um, I end up talking to them um, and listening to them and memorializing what they're talking about, typing away on my keyboard. My problem is that when I'm talking, I'm unable to type and talk at the same time. So yeah, you wanna make it second nature that you're doing this and you need to be doing it contemporaneously. Okay, doc, here are the things that you really need to be documented. Uh, all significant client interactions, even if they happen at the grocery store, at the golf course, at the movie theater. Uh, I had a uh, former managing partner that went to the beach came for a week and came back and he was outraged because a client basically put his towel next to him every day and pumped him on tax issues. And he came back and said, this was the first time I've ever been able to uh, bill a vacation, but I am definitely gonna be doing it. So yeah, to the extent that you're having these interactions, memorialize them. You speak to somebody on the golf course while walk, walking 18 holes or at the 19th hole, and they are asking you, what are the implications of a considered sale they're doing? Uh, does it qualify for this kind of treatment or that kind of treatment? Spell it out. When you get back to the office, write up a memo on that, send it off to them, indicate that, hey, I gave you some advice on this, but I hadn't completed the research. If you are actually contemplating having a transaction based on this, allow us to formally complete our research on that. So they don't go off half cocked based on what you shared with them, but you hadn't done the robust research on and later blame you for having missed something that ended up being integral to what was being done. So make it a habit document as soon as possible, so meaning contemporaneously. I will tell you that when I'm on these calls with policyholders, I will hang up the phone, finish writing up my notes, be posting that, and it's somewhere in that process I realize, hmm, here's something else I should have told them. If I had, if I waited till the end of the day to do this, it wouldn't be as fresh, I'd miss out on some issues, 
and I might not get the opportunity to call them back to clarify what I had meant. Document the facts. What I'm talking about here is don't add color to it. Um, this is what comes back to haunt you. I just don't trust that person. Um, this guy is an idiot. Um, this gal is new and probably needs some handholding. That's the kind of stuff that could end up being used against you down the road if you don't actually fulfill that. So that's the kind of stuff you've got to be careful about what you document. Facts, yes. Color, no. And always document your reasoning for what you've chosen to do or not to do that could be brought into question later. Okay, disengaging. Yeah, I will tell you that if everybody that's listening to this uh, were to um, come up with a list of how many disengagement letters they've authored, I would tell you that I participated in more than all of you combined during my career. Before coming to Cameco, I wouldn't probably like you. But since coming to Cameco, this is something that I've embraced doing and we get to do a lot for our policyholders. I'm not saying that I author them for our policyholders. No, I typically share multiple with them, tell them which one might be the best foundation for their, their letter. And then I encourage them to send it back to me in Microsoft Word format so I can turn on the track changes feature and offer my suggestions on that. Why do I want them to be the one that writes it? It's cathartic to do so. Yeah, I want CPAs to do this themselves and they can get their blood boiling and get it out of their system. Yeah, if that client is somebody that you're just glad to be done with, you can use those words. I think you're a low life scumbag and I hope you die. Yeah, you want somebody to proof that before you end up sending that out. I would likely strike that. In fact, likely is wrong. I would absolutely strike that because you want it to be the last communication you have with that client. So when are you gonna be disengaging? When the client's acting unethically, when they're being aggressive and pushing you around trying to get you to do something you don't think is right. Um, they're not taking your advice. If you keep advising them to do something and they do something else, you advise them something else and they do something else. It's like, no, they're not valuing your advice. And down the road, if something goes wrong, they're going to argue that you should have been more emphatic in suggesting what you did. So please, if they're not doing those things, problematic. If you think there's doubt about their ability to continue as a going concern, they've got people in the wrong spots on the bus. And you're thinking that, yeah, they're oh, just looking at having a, a dispute and conflicts down the road. No, if they're not providing you with the information you need in a timely manner so that you can end up getting the engagement done, yeah, you should be considering disengaging. At a minimum, you should, should be spelling out what difficulties you've encountered and what you're gonna require them to do to address that. And if they disagree to do that, yeah, you're gonna part ways with them. Hmm, they're not a good fit. What are we getting at here? Maybe your piece of the, the pie is you know, 270 degrees of the pie, and now they're working into that other quadrant that you don't practice in. And you're thinking, gosh, I would like to, I don't want to lose this client, but that's outside of my comfort zone. Either team with somebody else or disengage, uh, have them go somewhere else. And yeah, if they're not paying you, if they're not compensating you timely, get out of Dodge. Okay, here are the basics for disengaging. And you'll notice that we've got um, bold and green at the top, always disengage in writing, and bold and green at the bottom, keep it professional and not emotional. The client may very well be emotional with you. They may initiate a disengagement with you and be very colorful in what they're describing. You should be glad to be rid of them. Please do not voice that. Indicate you're sorry to, that it's reached this stage and come up with a structured disengagement letter. Um, whenever you're the one initiating the disengagement though, I would like for you to speak first with them. So they're not going, oh, got the latest newsletter from CPA. Mm -mm. You wanna speak with them and say, hey, we decided to go in another direction. And you don't have to articulate the specifics as to why, but you better have some reason, whether it's just, gosh, we have so much work to do and there's outsourcing that we're gonna be considering doing, but we still don't have enough services and we had to look at very critically at our client base and deciding which way to go. And unfortunately, we decided to part ways with you. State clearly the last date of service, uh, the status of the work. Hey, here are the three things that we still had going. Come up with a list of that. Here are the things that my successor is gonna be needing to take on. Spell those things out. What the due dates for all these things are. Why? This is even when the client has disengaged you, I want you to provide them with this recipe for success for your successor. Why? Because when the successor blows it, 
your client and the successor is going to say, hey, it's not my fault. It was that predecessor for not telling us that. If you're owed something, you have something in WIP or outstanding invoices, spell those out as well. That, yeah, these are the things that you guys need to be addressing and getting back to um, paying us on. The idea here is, here's the balance that is owed to us. Your prompt payment would be appreciated. Do I expect you to collect all this? No. Do I want you to pursue collection on this? Not necessarily. You may be more than willing to write this off, but don't write it off in your disengagement letter. That's my preference, just so that the client doesn't use that as a suggestion that, hey, you didn't even think your work was worth it. Um, cooperate. You're going to indicate you're going to cooperate with your, with your successor as necessary. Use those two words in your disengagement letter, as necessary. Why? Because you may choose not to because your client has withheld payment on things. Um, so yeah, your client is going to end up having to give you an authorization to speak openly with that successor. If they don't, that's another thing you want to communicate here. Always state the disposition of the client records. I've got these things. I don't have anything else. That's the kind of stuff I've returned those to you. But do not return the client records in the disengagement letter. Were you to do so, and the client were to later allege that they didn't receive your disengagement letter, you would have successfully, arguably, thrown away their records. So no, indicate that we still have X, Y, and Z. And if you want those things, please tell us how you'd like to get it. I also want you to have that defensive documentation of having sent this and them having received it by sending it in a way where you have proof of delivery. Certified mail usually works for that, but other times people use some other methodology for doing so. If you send them an email and they acknowledge that email, you don't have to send it via certified mail, right? Just re re retain that email they sent back. And yeah, keep it clean. If possible, wait till the next day to end up sending it so that you can look it over yourself to make sure that it's not something that's going to arrive as a bomb and, and initiate a negative response back from them. Because ideally, this would be the last communication you end up having with this now former client. Okay, when do you not wish to disengage? Anytime close to a deadline. Uh, to the extent that you do that, the client could argue that you didn't provide them with ample time to secure the services for another qualified professional. Uh, hey, if you end up disengaging, it's likely you're not gonna end up being paid. So recognize that. So a lot of CPAs struggle with this because gosh, I don't wanna disengage now because they owe us this money. I want them to pay me that and then I'll disengage. The problem is that as it gets closer and closer to the next deadline, um, you may be tripped into doing work beyond what you wish to do. Angry clients could make false accusations against you. So you want to try to keep this amicable as you're disengaging. Um, you could end up losing that client relationship. It's going to be, you will, and there's going to be a, a bad result in your referral opportunities. You're not going to get too many new clients from former clients that you have disengaged. And yeah, it can end up impacting your reputational risk as those people you disengage from may choose to be bad mouthing you in the social media, in their net, in their network of people, et cetera. Okay, here's some documentation tips. Uh, make it routine to do this. Engagement letters, have them for all engagement letters, any changes in engagement letters, every disengagement you do, you're gonna wanna have these things in writing. Yeah, you can talk to these people about it, but then ultimately put it in writing. Come up with standard formats for these things. Even disengagement letters. Cameco's got into the teens of sample disengagement letters, but no one of those is good off the shelf. You have to end up modifying them to suit. Anytime you provide oral advice to somebody, follow up with an email or letter that uh, specifies what it was you said so that you've communicated, not so that it could be understood, but rather so it could not be misunderstood. And basically when you're gonna be doing an an engagement letter or a proposal on somebody, offer them everything under the sun, but only document and engage for what they have agreed to have you do. Anytime there's a conflict, yeah, you're going to want to get a written conflict of interest acknowledgement waiver back from them that they are fine with you doing this. Please know that the AICPA Code of Conduct does not require these waivers to be in writing. Treasury Circular 230 does, and that is the best practice to follow. Okay. I mentioned non-engagement before, but these are the things that you're gonna to wanna to have in a non-engagement letter. Thanking them for their interest in you. Hey, they really wanted to come with you, show your appreciation. Indicate that no, even though we met with you, we never did engage to do this work. Um, 
and basically spell out that you're not going to be doing the work and any discussions that you had were never finalized and actually strongly encourage them to secure the services of another qualified tax professional or whatever services you are being asked to perform. Okay, memorialize client interactions. Yeah, I talked about being on the golf course, the 19th hole to the grocery store. Yeah, and what is it you need to be doing here? Uh, document these things. What goes in your files out there? Anything you created, sent, received for any attest engagement, you better re retain. Any conclusions, opinions, analyses, financial data, or inconsistent items. What was that last one? Inconsistent items retain. I used to do fraud investigations, and before I became a CFE, I was doing these things wrong. To the extent that something was, that was not incriminating against the alleged fraudster, um, I didn't consider maintaining the documentation on that. You got to. To the extent that what you're looking at doesn't support the position on your attest engagement, retain it. Come up with a reason for why you can distinguish it from the results that you came up with. Don't, because it doesn't support your position, ignore it. The extent that you send emails to somebody else on this, recognize that they may very well be retaining it. So disposing of those things don't, doesn't work to your advantage. Lastly, yeah, it's the reasonable person standards. Uh, document necessary for a reasonable person to understand this. So to the extent that you're doing it for yourself, you do. To the extent somebody else looking over your shoulder has to understand it, did you really articulate it well enough? Possibly not. So what does not go into your work papers. What aren't you going to be retaining? Superseded work papers need not be retained. If you're doing litigation support work, that and it's, you basically typically wish to be getting rid of the prior versions of your drafts because you don't want somebody um, on the other side to look back and say, what changed? Why did you decide to do this and that or the other? So to the extent that something is superseded and you don't see an obvious reason to retain it, purge that. To the extent that you have duplicates, purge those. There's software out there out there that can deduplicate what you've got. So do that. Copies of client records. You aren't supposed to be redundant with what the client records are. To the extent that you've shown tick marks on something, maybe you want to be retaining those. But the AR ledger that is uh, 120 pages, you only need to keep the pages that evidence what it was that you did. In a prior life, when I was doing uh, review notes, I was looking over engagements, I was tempted to retain my review notes. I quickly figured out not a good habit to have. Why? Even though it would inform future work that I was doing, future reviews that I was doing, to make sure that I was addressing issues that needed to be addressed, or at least I'd addressed on similar engagements in the past, it's problematic to retain those. Why? Because if you do, it's a roadmap for plaintiff's counsel coming back later to allege that you did not meet the status, the standards of care. Look at how inept you were. Look at all these mistakes you made or a colleague had made. So get rid of those review notes. To-do lists. Anything that you've completed on the to-do list, bye-bye, wave goodbye to those. And voicemail messages. You don't need to be retaining all of those. So purge those over time. Ding, ding, ding. If it turns out that some of those or evidence you need to have as defensive documentation, retain those. Those electronic files should become part of your permanent file and or your work papers. Here's some other helpful hints out there. Make documentation a good habit. If you're document, just make it a habit of doing it. Anytime there's a significant interaction with your clients, memorialize those. Always document contemporaneously. Again, bringing it back to me. That call I've just done with a policyholder, I'm memorializing that before I pick up that phone is ringing because my admin people have figured out I've hung up the phone and I can take another call. I can't until I finish the paperwork on that one. Document only the facts and yeah, document using the appropriate level. You're not going to do that via text much, but every once in a while, that might be sufficient. A letter is stronger than a text, which is bigger than MSG, MS Teams, et cetera. So to the extent that something is more significant, I go up that list of hierarchy there. Okay, your record retention and destruction policy. How long are you going to hold on to these things? I don't address it here, but to the extent that you're performing a test services, I'm going to want you to spell out in that engagement letter, for that matter, in your portal agreement, that you're not going to be retaining these things beyond 60 days that are the client's records. They need to be retaining whatever you provide back to them so that you can avoid having that hosting interpretation implication here. Because to the extent that you are 
basically their filing cabinet. They never have to retain these things once they've given them to you. You've impaired your independence. So spell that out in your record retention and destruction policy. Make sure that you get somebody within your own organization that would be the one that makes the one-offs on this. So to the extent that your client, pardon me, your firm comes back and says, do I need to hold on to this any longer? Is there a reason I might wish to hold on to this longer than something else? Somebody other than the engagement partner should be the one that overall for the firm says, yep, that's the way to do it here. You're going to want to come up with these things, inventory them so you know what's uh, where, what's being retained. And to the extent that you no longer need to hold on to them, purge them timely. What you don't want to have is a policy where you're retaining them and some of these things you're retaining and some of them you're purging because that really was what ended up getting Arthur Anderson in trouble. They selectively adhered to their record retention and destruction policy. No, you want to have it be a one size fits all unless you've documented the reasoning for why you're not doing that. So yeah, have written approval from that documentation czar whenever you're doing that. And this last one here, when you're disposing of anything in electronic or paper, dispose of it properly so that it cannot be taken on by somebody else. That includes your printers out there because the last thing printed is going to be saved on there. Um, to the extent that you are purging paper, um, you, you want to make sure that stuff is shred. When I first joined Camico, one of my colleagues had a call with somebody talking about record retention and his, he was hanging up the phone with the client, overheard the client say, okay, you can dump, you can throw it in the dumpster. No, you got to make sure things are appropriately destroyed. So the destruction of records. Before destroying those records, verify the client has been advised you're going to do so. What better way that, to do that than to have it in your engagement letter so they know what your record retention destruction policy is and you're following that. Always comply with that policy unless you have an exception on that. I've seen signed itemized list of whatever records you end up returning to the client so they can't come back later and say, you never gave me that. No, no, no. Make sure you're retaining that list of whatever you provided them. And when you're destroying them, come up with a list of that. Yeah, it was the 2015 files that got purged today for all of these clients. And when destroying records, yeah, obtain written authorization from that documentation czar. Retain a log of what was destroyed and verify that there's no litigation going on. Yeah, there's the problem. Uh, every once in a while, there's a need for a litigation hold. And that record retention czar, your firm, needs to be made aware of that. So an appropriate hold is what's put on there. And for that matter, any emails that may be going on in there. No, no, no. We want to make sure those things aren't being destroyed. Financial reporting. Yeah, there are pronouncements out there that say what needs to be documented out there. AUC 230 spells out what's supposed to be done on audits. But ding, ding, ding. Non-attest services. We're talking about doing tax returns, valuations out there. What are the objectives of what you're doing? What are the services you're gonna be performing? What are the client's acceptance and their responsibilities? What are your responsibilities? And any limitations on the scope of your, of your performance on a non-attest service should be memorialized. So yeah, you should have an engagement letter for that. This is particularly important when you're performing attest services for a client. Okay, let's get into the definitions. And a test is one that there's going to be independence is required. A non-attest service is one when independence is not required. But you can perform non-attest services for an attest client. And when that happens, there's certain requirements that have to be fulfilled. Basically, that client has to agree to designate somebody with the skill, knowledge, and experience to take responsibility for those non-attest services. Otherwise, the firm performing the attest services would be impairing their independence by not having them do that. You wouldn't have complied with professional standards if you didn't have a written understanding with the client where they agreed to do that. You would impair your independence if they didn't fulfill that obligation. Okay, some tax loss prevention best practices. Follow FIRAC, facts, issues, research, analysis, conclusion. If you end up following that protocol and documenting that protocol on any tax issues, you're not going to have a paid repair penalty. You could end up being wrong but the IRS or your local state tax authority won't come back and say, hey, you didn't appropriately address this. No, you did your homework. You just missed it, or at least they alleged you did. FBAR, to the extent you got foreign activity out there, make sure that you're spelling that out in an organizer. And I would prefer to have that client sign off on that and have it prioritized on the first page of your organizer. The extent that you're going to be representing a client before the IRS, have a power of attorney and basically 
don't agree to sign off, however, on anything, a settlement agreement. That power of attorney is a wonderful thing to have. Um, you need to have it to represent them before the IRS, for that matter, representing your clients before the Department of Labor. You should have that, but don't be the one that ends up signing that settlement agreement. Engagement letters, have them, sign them. Uh, make sure they sign them. Um, consider having, if you're doing an extension, let's fast forward to next year, the April 15th due dates are right around the corner. Hmm. You're rushing to get all these extensions done. To the extent that it's a significant client, to the extent that there's ample time to get this extension done and, and get some feedback with your client, send off to your client what these significant items were that you considered in that extension. So if it turns out there were some that they're aware of that you're not, they can bring them to your attention so that you're not put in that predicament where, sorry, you put us on extension, but you didn't have enough paid in and now there's an underpayment penalty. Whenever there is a significant issue out there, inform your clients of the issue, advise them of what you think that they should be doing. And thirdly, get their written consent back on what they decide to do. Under the SASs and the SARs, recognize that must and should have similar meanings, but different. Whenever the standards say that a CPA must do something, they must. To the extent that they should do something, that's presumed to be presumptively mandatory. So you must do it unless you memorialize in writing why it was okay for you not to end up doing that. Okay, audit documentation, what do you have to retain? Findings, actions, discussions, responses, conclusions all those things you end up needing to memorialize in your audit work papers. Uh, to the extent that you do that, you got to do it so that an experienced auditor would understand what you did. Remember, these work papers aren't what you're going to be providing to the client. It's going to be provided to document what you've done, and so your peer reviewer is going to end up un understanding it. So yeah, the nature, timing of the procedures you've done, the results, the evidence, the conclusions, and all these things reconcile back to the financial statements. This is something that you're going to look at and flinch. Okay, audits. Within 60 days, you have to have documented, 60 days after uh, issuing your report, you have to document all these things in your files. And people talk about these being locked down. I want you to understand that you cannot delete anything after 60 days that's in there, but you can go in and contemporaneously date something to append to what's there. Yes, you can do that. And that's something I would encourage you to do if you're engagement gets called by the Department of Labor to look at it. Have somebody else that's gonna be uh, look, look at those records before you send it off to the DOL rep for that inspection. To the extent that you see some deficiencies in there that don't end up impacting the report, consider having some contemporaneous modifications done now uh, and initial and date them now. So you're not trying to hide the ball, but that way when they see that, they're not gonna say that it did not satisfy the standard of care. So here's some documentation pitfalls out there for people on SARS engagements. Those are reviews, compilations, and preparations. On a review, everything on that list needs to end up being documented. On a compilation and a preparation, everything needed to be, pardon me, only two things were mandatory, significant consultations, findings, or issues, and their resolution and engagement letters need to be documented. But you're not gonna have to do analytic reviews. So you're not gonna bother documenting that. Uh, you're not going to end up looking at inquiries of management unless they happen, uh, then you don't have to document them. But to the extent that you have significant issues out there, yeah, you got to raise them. So you might be providing nothing in the way of assurance, but to the extent that you stumble upon something, maybe a doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, yeah, you got to memorialize those discussions. Anything that you've discussed that's significant and any representations you maintain. Wait a minute compilation and preparation services, they don't require any representations. Yeah, but sometimes you might want to get a representation letter. You have represented to us that you will not be selling uh, your business. You have no contemplation and you represented to us that um, these are the steps we're going to be taking to address this doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Yeah, get those in a representation letter. Okay, communicating internal control deficiencies in an audit, always kind of problematic. You're supposed to be looking for material weaknesses. To the extent that you're looking for material weaknesses, you're going to stumble upon significant deficiencies. To the extent that you stumble on significant deficiencies, you're required to communicate them and material weaknesses to those charged with governance. Great. To the extent that you come upon a control deficiency, and that's something that 
does not warrant communication to those charged with governance, that's problematic. You've decided what didn't need to be communicated. I'm going to tell you, you may wish to label them that way and still end up communicating them and document having done so. Also, please understand that what's changed with uh, SAS 145 having to do with um, risk assessments, you're going to want to be looking at what the material risks are um, and looking at that and communicating that to the extent that you identify those before you've issued your engagement letter, you can put that in there, but you're supposed to be communicating those with that with those charged with governance at the outset of the engagement. So here's some rules out there regarding that. You got to do these things in writing. You got to be communicating significant deficiencies. You have to be communicating material weaknesses out there. But remember, you're looking for material weaknesses to the extent that you stumble upon significant deficiencies, you're going to be communicating them. To the extent that you told them about this last year and the year before that, you still got to tell them about that this year. That's what that deja vu has to do with. These, these communications are supposed to be going to those charged with governance of your audit client. This has to be done within 60 days of releasing the financial statements. And you cannot put out any kind of communication, even though you, you found two material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies, you can't say there weren't any significant deficiencies because that suggests that there weren't any. It's just that you didn't stumble upon them and you weren't looking for them. So don't do that and, write, and clearly articulate that this is for internal purposes only. Uh, your letter should state just that. It's not a full-blown internal control evaluation and you're documenting that to them. Uh, you're gonna disclaim on the internal control, merely stating these are the things we noted of concern here. Define all these terms and again, restrict this to internal use. You also need to find out who it is that you should be communicating this to, send it to them at the outset, communicate who that is and articulate this at the beginning when you're saying what things you've discovered in planning and again at the end of it. Always spell out what your responsibilities are, what their responsibilities are, when you're planning on having these deliverables and communicating all findings out there. And here's some illustrative things of what some findings could be. I'm not gonna go through all these. Suffice it to say, I want you to be printing this thing out and using it as a checklist for things to be addressing out there. One of the things that I didn't communicate was non-compliance with laws and regulations. So yeah, you need to communicate those things and document having communicated your concerns regarding non-compliance with laws and regulations and what the client is planning on doing regarding that. That's on audits, reviews, basically any services you perform. So. What are the recommendations we have regarding this? Engagement planning, documented. Risk assessments, documented. Materiality considerations, both quantitatively and qualitatively, document them. The linkage between your risk assessments and your actual procedures performed on an audit needs to be documented. Update all of this stuff throughout the engagement and any conclusions you reach, memorialize those. Um, let the client fill out the internal control questionnaire. You don't need to be the one doing it. To the extent that you did it last year, feel free to share that with them, Turn, have them turn on track changes so you can readily identify what they've changed. And yeah, I want you to be using industry templates on this. So it's not a one size fits all. What would be good for the car dealerships would be different from what you have to do for financial institutions, which is different from employee benefit plans, which is different from construction companies. So come up with templates for each of these, whether you develop them or modify that what you get from PPC or another provider, I don't care, but use what's best for you. Uh, client specific programs. Yeah. So this is within the construction industry, but they got this nuance for backlog. I want to address on this one. Ding. Partner involvement. I want you to have partners involved at the top. If what I found from the risk assessment standards implementation, a lot of audit partners complained about it, but yeah, the work product ended up being better because of it. The extent that you're doing some brainstorming on audits, yeah, you have to do this for material misstatements and fraud risk. You can go ahead and combine both of those. So I would encourage you to do just that. Uh, but to the extent that people are coming up with what the risks are, don't poo-poo them and say, no, no, we got that addressed here. Come up with all what, what all the risks are before you end up addressing whether or not they're addressed appropriately. And lastly here, make sure your programs are in plain English. You don't want somebody not to be able to understand the terminology you have in there. Okay, recognize documentation is getting, gonna get you out of trouble, it is critical, and it's gonna be something that gets you in trouble if you put the wrong thing down or not enough. 
stay informed and in control of what's going on to safeguard your firm against problems that are coming down the road. So maintain good client relationships and document those communications to do so. Here's the contact information for me and for Cameco. I know I went fast. There's a lot of content here. If I can give you one takeaway, it's don't rest on your laurels regarding the quality management standards. Start implementing them now. Thank you very much. Hope you have a wonderful um, busy season and holiday season. Thank you.